Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining for that third edition of our Green and Sustainable Talks. Um, today, we'll address three topics that you've actually chosen uh, through the survey that you've answered. You've been uh, 96 to answer that survey, so thank you very much for taking the time. And the topics you've chosen are um, topics uh, regarding biodiversity and its integration in sustainable finance. Uh, another one on uh, ECB's avenues to intensify climate action in quest of punch. And the last one, uh, but not the least, ESG integration in private debt towards uh, data template convergence. So we'll start with um, the, the one on biodiversity. The second one uh, will be uh, uh, ECB's one. And the third one will be integration in private debt of ESG. So just a, a quick reminder of uh, where does that come from, where the, these articles come from the newsletters that we uh, publish uh, bi-monthly. Uh, you can find it, uh, find it on the internet uh, and it's, uh, it's open source. So you can um, find all the data that uh, will probably be exposed today uh, on, the, on the website uh, with uh, the different articles that they refer to. If you like our content, please make sure to follow us on uh, social networks. Uh, we're present in there as well. So I'll present the first and second topics on uh, biodiversity and ECB's uh, green tilting mechanism. And um, Thomas Girard and William Sharp, both from the Green and Sustainable Hub Syndicate team, will present the last topic, ESG integration in uh, private debt. Without further ado, um, let's dig into um, the biodiversity one. So it was titled uh, Climate is Dead, Long Live Biodiversity. Um, and here it comes. So last December uh, was the COP15 in Montreal, uh, which gave birth to the Kunming Montreal uh, Agreement, um, the, convention, the Convention on the Biodiversity Framework. Uh, and um, that framework reached a tremendous agreement with four long-term goals uh, to, <clears throat> for 2050 and 23 sub-targets to be reached by uh, 2030. Um, this uh, agreement actually um, translates uh, scientific uh, work into political action. Uh, this is a, a great step and the COP15 has often been um, uh, said to be the Paris Agreement for Biodiversity. One of the main, um, one of the main uh, objective is to protect 30% of the, the planet's surface and, and ensuring that 30% of degraded ecosystems are under restoration by 2030. Um, this is, a, this is a, a great deal for countries, but what are the objectives that are concrete for companies? So the work that we have done is to uh, go through all the targets and the most relevant one for companies and see how um, these targets could be used by companies uh, in order to set their own targets regarding biodiversity topics and themes. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, we've analyzed how they, they had already integrated such targets in sustainable finance products. So one of the, the most interesting targets uh, is probably uh, target 19. Um, which is about sustainable finance contributing to um, financing biodiversity, uh, halting biodiversity loss and restoring biodiversity. Um, here we can see that a lot of the targets here have already uh, been implemented in uh, EU regulation. Uh, we can see here, for example, that the nature restoration law already uh, provides that 30% uh, target of uh, areas degraded that should be restored by 2030. Um, so most of the targets in the COP15 are actually already in place in EU law. Um, then we dug a little deeper on the biodiversity topic. It can seem uh, at first quite intriguing and complex uh, as compared to uh, climate uh, objectives, uh, but really in some ways it is similar. For example, there are several pathways um, like um, temperature scenarios for climate 
that can be uh, exposed. Uh, here on the on this graph, um, you can see that there is um, a pathway to halt biodiversity loss by 2030. Um, this pathway is expressed in, a, in an indicator here that is the mean species abundance. We'll go on, on that indicator later, but it is it could be compared to CO2, uh, but with more complex features um, for climate. Uh, to reach that goal of halting biodiversity loss by 2030, several pathways and societal choices should be made. Um, the one focusing, for example, on more technologies uh, like intensifying uh, agricultural agriculture and uh, increasing its productivity. Um, so using less land would mean preserving some of the intact land that, that is still intact. Um, another solution would be to, to use the more decentralized solutions. So expand protected areas, reduce nat nature fragmentation and reduce infrastructure expansion. So that, that is to say, reduce land artificialization with buildings and other infrastructure uh, like, like roads, etc. Uh, and a third one would be a consumption change pathway, which is more demand side here. That is to say that uh, citizens and consumers should change their behaviors in order to um, preserve biodiversity, halt and reverse biodiversity loss. So here uh, it is uh, um, it is from the IPBES actually, which is the equivalent of the IPCC for climate, but for the biodiversity topic. And it provides these pathways that are readable um, and understandable uh, by everyone, like temperature pathways for uh, climate. But the comparison with climate becomes way more complex. Uh, and indeed, uh, because Biodiversity is multifaceted. Uh, the, the different drivers of biodiversity loss uh, are, are numerous and vary according to geographies, uh, sectors, etc. But there is a, a global dominance hier hierarchy of the, the five direct drivers of biodiversity loss that you can see here. The first one being land and sea use change. That would be um, deforestation, for example. The second one would be direct <laughs> exploitation. That would be um, uh, resource extraction, such as mining activities. The third one would be um, pollution. Uh, that would be uh, SOx and NOx, so nitrous oxide and sulfur oxide emissions that are uh, very, uh, um, very um, nefast for the environment, but not greenhouse gases. And then comes climate change, which with increased temperatures uh, provokes uh, fires, for example, and destroys also biodiversity. The fifth one would be invasive alien species, which come from transfers uh, from uh, a geography to another of species uh, through, for example, um, boats, planes, etc. So that are the five main drivers of biodiversity loss. And these five main drivers will um, entail in uh, other sub indicators. For example, uh, terrestrial land use would be the hectare of land used uh, by a construction uh, company uh, to build uh, new buildings. Uh, on the water use, uh, there could be the, the, the water that is being extracted for production purposes. Uh, the, the contaminants to water would be uh, accounted into uh, the pollution driver. The GHG emission would be accounted in the climate change. And that's where we can see that both climate and biodiversity collide, that biodiversity loss is actually encompassing climate change. Uh, and the last ones, invasive species. All of these subcategories can give plenty of indicators, CO2, CH4 for GH emission, but also for pollution, etc. And, and this makes biodiversity way more complex than climate, where actually there is one synthetic indicator, which is CO2 equivalent, uh, which is fungible, highly material, comparable, and can be monitored at many different scales from the earth system to households. Um, and this is where there's a, a huge difference. Biodiversity is actually 
unique at a, a point, uh, a geographical point on Earth, whereas CO2 e emissions or greenhouse gas emissions have the same effect everywhere in the world and it is uh, fungible in the atmosphere. So how can we measure biodiversity uh, on a given territory or for uh, uh, by the impact of a company on biodiversity? Um, there are plenty of metrics and indicators, um, synthetic ones, ones that are specific to a given territory, um, and they have been here benchmarked by uh, the um, European Commission. Uh, 40 of them have been benchmarked. You can find this uh, document in the article if you are interested. Um, and it's they are very different uh, as to their methods. Uh, some assess the state of an ecosystem. Others assess the richness, the evenness and heterogeneity of living organism in an area. And other uh, rank uh, an area according to uh, rarity, diversity, fragmentation, habitat conditions and other characteristics. Uh, they can be used for impact assessment and life cycle analysis for some of them, like the, the, the life cycle analysis you can see uh, uh, for the carbon footprint. Some of them can be used for a biodiversity footprint um, and also to compensate the impacts. Same as for CO2 um, with uh, carbon credits, for example, there could be a compensation of uh, impacts uh, on key species with biodiversity. Um, and by the way, COP15 called for the use of uh, innovative financing mechanisms such as uh, biodiversity uh, offsets that, uh, that could be um, a way to, to come close to carbon offsets uh, and um, finance uh, biodiversity conservation. So one of these indicators uh, seem to be uh, prevalent at the time uh, with some others, but we chose to focus on uh, on the mean species abundance for uh, for today. Um, this uh, this uh, assessment uh, allows uh, to to both assess at a territorial level and at an entity level, or even uh, or even more globally at a at a global level. So it's uh, it allows to conciliate both global objectives and. Uh, local realities, uh, which is something that is uh, quite hard to do when it comes to biodiversity. It can be used for products, uh, biodiversity footprints, but also for corporates and, uh, and at global scale, and it, uh, it can be used for life cycle analysis. So how does it work? Uh, the, the, the mean species abundance is an indicator of biodiversity intactness on a given ecosystem or territory. It can, it can be established in two ways. One is to count the, num the number of uh, species on a given uh, plot, uh, that is to say on a, on a given uh, square kilometer area, for example, um, and to compare it to a, to a completely intact ecosystem. The completely intact ecosystem would be rated one, so it is not being, it has not been degraded, and the um, the ecosystem that has been degraded would be between zero and one. So um, this is a computa this is a computation. Uh, it gives a, a, a sort of score to a, an ecosystem. And there's a certain way to um, to to calculate that indicator. It is from the pressure. Uh, of uh, a given company, for example. Let's say a, a company uh, emits uh, sulfur oxide or nitrous oxide. It uh, uses um, a thousand quil kilometer, square kilometer of lands um, and um, it also emits uh, uh, X tons of CO2. There is a, a model called the Globio model that will be able to translate these pressures uh, CO2 emissions into an MSA uh, mean species abundance score and to aggregate uh, to aggregate that score into a one individual uh, grade for an entire company, for example, uh, according to the different uh, pressures and indicators that it would that it would uh, uh, fill in order to, to rate the company. 
Um, that indicator is a synthetic indicator that encompasses all uh, the drivers uh, the, uh, of biodiversity loss uh, and helps with having a synthetic views that help to pilot and drive uh, a company's biodiversity footprint and impact on biodiversity. So that's, that is really useful in order to, to, to drive and how could it be used actually um, uh, in sustainable finance? That is, a, that is a question we asked ourselves uh, and we went further in exploring how already biodiversity has been included in sustainable finance products. So we made a, a little study of um, on a few sustainability linked financing, sustainability linked bonds at first, um, uh, over a sample of 233 sustainability linked bond frameworks and over uh, 1173 sustainability linked loans uh, in order to identify what was the proportion of these loans that included KPIs that are related to uh, drivers of biodiversity loss. And we can see here that around 20% of the KPIs are already tackling biodiversity issues. Uh, which are uh, land use change for some of them, uh, with uh, food waste that has been uh, that has been used in the agri-food industry, or deforestation uh, that has been used on a, on an SLB actually uh, in uh, Uruguay's SLB. Uh, for the loans, uh, we had our own sample on that, and we we saw the same almost the same proportion of uh, sustainability in loans integrating such uh, KPIs, such as uh, they, they, they were, they amounted to 18%. But um, what sustainable financial product is more suited for biodiversity actually? That is a question we asked ourselves. And well, UOPs, use of proceeds in green bonds have been very rarely um, targeted towards uh, biodiversity related expenditures. Um, so it is quite hard um, for a, a company to identify biodiversity related expenditures and because indeed it is conserving, preserving biodiversity, protecting it, restoring it is more, um, uh, is more, is not capex uh, intensive. It is more demanding in terms of business model change and practices uh, that that must change, uh, rather than uh, than uh, expenses that uh, that must be made. Um, so the, sta the sustainability linked mechanism seems better suited for biodiversity purposes. But of course, um, for SSAs, it's simpler to identify maybe um, uh, biodiversity expenses. Uh, we know that uh, France with its OAT has targeted quite a, a lot of expenditures um, that are related to biodiversity. Yet, uh, there is an obvious case for biodiversity related sustainability linked bonds for um, for SSAs and particularly when it comes to deforestation, for example. We can think about uh, Brazil, we can think about Uruguay uh, and, and other countries which could use such KPIs in uh, sustainability linked bond frameworks. So this is it for uh, the biodiversity topic. Uh, make sure to ask the, the questions you have, you may have uh, in the chat. Uh, we'll answer them at uh, the end of the, the, the presentation of the articles um, and we're now going to go uh, over ECB's avenues to intensify climate action in quest of punch. So if you haven't followed what happened uh, at the, the end of last year uh, at the ECB, uh, well the ECB went a, a bit further in, uh, in acting for uh, its own decarbonation uh, and indeed um, it is actually uh, implementing a climate score uh, in its uh, corporate sector purchase program and its PEPP um, and the holdings uh, of the BCE, uh, the ECB are actually being tilted towards bet better climate performance according to uh, some indicators what which are greenhouse gas emissions, the, the, the carbon emission uh, reduction targets and the, the, the and companies climate related disclosures. But it's, uh, it's 
not only thinking about its CSPP, but also its collateral rules uh, framework for banks. Uh, and e it will include uh, and limit the share of assets issued by entities with high carbon footprints that can be pledged as collaterals before the end of 2024, according to that climate score. Uh, so we'll dig a, a, a bit better, in, uh, a bit uh, deeper in um, the climate score here. So the approach uh, will be based on issuer specific uh, climate score for the CSPP. Uh, and it will uh, it will grade companies according to uh, emissions subscore, so past emissions and how uh, they have performed in a, in the in the previous years in decarbonate in decarbonating their uh, their uh, companies, but also the rate the targets and uh, their disclosures whether the company are transparent on. Um, on emissions, uh, whether they disclose COP1, 2, and 3, etc., etc. Over the timeline, uh, it started in uh, October 2022. We have already seen uh, some of the effects uh, on the market, actually. Um, and uh, the, the ECB in Q1 2023 and uh, last month published uh, a bit more information on the indicators that it is using, but will not fully disclose how it uh, weighs uh, companies and sectorially and between themselves uh, the, the, the different scores um, and at the end uh, of the year it will uh, review uh, its climate score methodology and it may amend that methodology. So let's dig into the indicators that are being used. Um, it is calculated from three aggregated uh, subscore um, so past GHG emission, as we said, so scope one and two data for the issuer uh, that would be uh, under a best in universe approach and scope three data at sector level uh, that would be uh, a best in class approach. So scope three data is being compared to uh, sectorial peers uh, and uh, the, the, the foreseen effects and incentives on issuers is that it will incentivize uh, uh, the decrease in carbon emissions of some uh, some issuers and penalize brown sectors, um, but in these brown uh, in this brown sector, the forerunners, the the, the transitioners, will uh, be better rated and therefore prioritized by the ECB uh, in order to figure in their uh, balance sheet. So the forward-looking look target subscore um, is uh, is uh, being assessed on concrete short-term targets the ambition of that target, whether they are science-based or not. Uh, so we can think about uh, SBTI certification, for example, uh, and whether they are, are validated by any other third party. It will incentivize, obviously, all eligible issuers to plan and set up their forward-looking uh, uh, decarbonization targets. Uh, it, but challenges remains around uh, target assessment. Uh, we all know that SBTI doesn't uh, assess the means to achieve these targets. So um, a company could set a target maybe without providing a, an actual transition plan um, uh, that would uh, uh, make uh, him reach that uh, that target, make it reach that target. So this is sort of the transition plan related with uh, which is another uh, EU um, uh, regulation feature with the CSRD uh, that will uh, prevail maybe in the years to come in order for the ECB to identify um, the, the ambitiousness of the, the corporates regarding their transition plans. Um, the climate disclosure subscores is based on a GHG emissions uh, disclosure, of course, um, and whether they are verified by a third party or not. But um, that, that system relies on uh, on estimated or modeled data on issuers uh, emission because sometimes they are not available so uh, uh, the estimated model estimation models are being used um, and uh, that uh, climate disclosure subscore is more of a black box we don't know uh, how really what are the um, what are the, the specifics uh, of that score? Um, but it provides for sure the, the, the your system with better insights into issuers' uh, climate related financial risks and um, and uh, and gives it a, a better view uh, on the on the disclosure of uh, the companies in order to 
incentivize also uh, the disclosure of companies and, and gives them a, a positive notch if uh, they are disclosing quite transparently. Um, so the, the climate scores uh, of individual issuers will of course not be disclosed. Um, it, would, uh, it, it wouldn't help with uh, market stability, of course. Um, for now, the euro system will not sell holdings uh, because um, their issuer might have a, a low climate score, for example. Um, public debts are still excluded, uh, despite accounted for uh, around 79% uh, of the APP. Um, and, um, and the foreseeable effects, of course, uh, are uh, improvements in climate disclosure, target setting, etc., that we've uh, already seen. So, um, with uh, the, 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 the stop uh, in quantitative easing uh, and a, a rather uh, quantitative tightening approach, um, the, the, the first approach of the ECB to um, re uh, to invest redemptions according uh, to that climate score is being quite inadequate uh, now because the system was designed before the inflationary uh, uh, phenomenon and therefore is not really adapted to that kind of economy and the, the rhythm and the pace at which uh, the ECB will decarbonize its portfolio is not satisfying, according to, uh, to, to science, to say that it will be aligned to the, the Paris Agreement. That is one of the, 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 the greatest challenges uh, that it is uh, facing right now. So there is actually a double constraint, uh, preserving price stability, uh, which is the main mandate of uh, the ECB. Uh, all the while intensifying its own decarbonation. And that is a real issue uh, for the ECB. Isabel Schneibel, um, member of the ECB's executive board, uh, explored the, the solutions that could be put in place. So this is uh, still hypothetical uh, and not uh, something that will be put in place. Um, in order to uh, bypass that issue, that pace and rhythm issue, uh, and uh, and to go further. So as of today, ECB's climate ambition strongly relies on its portfolio's assets on transition. So that is to say the, the transition of the companies in its portfolio. And you can see on the graph that the distribution of its uh, portfolio is quite uh, tilted in a sense. Um, less than 5% of uh, its uh, portfolio uh, in, uh, in amount. Um, uh, in number of uh, companies represents uh, more than 80% of uh, total absolute GHG emission contribution of the portfolio. So that is to say that a very a little number of, um, of assets in its portfolio represent for a large chunk of the emissions. Um, so this needs to be addressed and how should it be addressed? Well, Isabel Schnabel envisioned some of uh, some of the levels um, with stronger incentive for highly emissive corporates to decarbonize uh, and extending green tilting to covered bonds and asset backed securities in order to um, to help with uh, going faster in, uh, in its portfolio decarbonization. She also stressed that um, they should not divest completely, at least not initially, from those companies whose actions are particularly important in managing the green transition, that is to say the highly emissive industries, but rather to foster incentives for them to reduce emissions further. So she leaves sort of a door open to divesting from some company, not uh, at first, but uh, maybe in the longer term. That is very hypothetical again, but still it's a, it's a, it's a strong signal. Um, last but not least, she also evoked that uh, the public sector uh, that represents more than half of ECB's portfolio um, could uh, be um, uh, tilted according to, to climate, uh, not climate scores, because it's too hard uh, from a methodological um, perspective to assess a sovereign or supranationals or an agency according to its climate performance, but rather uh, oriented towards um, products. That is to say, uh, a, a supranational government that would issue um, a green bond, for example, may be favored 
uh, versus vanilla bonds um, and uh, by the ECB in order to tilt its portfolio towards greener assets. Um, so these are all the, the levers envisioned for the ECB to decarbonize its own portfolio uh, according to the climate cause that we've presented uh, before. So that's it for uh, this article. Uh, thank you very much uh, and please feel free to ask any questions. I will now, now leave the floor to uh, William Sharp and Thomas Girard for ESG integration in private debt toward data template convergence. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christian. Hello, everyone, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the final segment of today's Green and Sustainable Talks entitled ESG Integration in Private Debt Towards Data Template Convergence. This presentation is based on an article published in our recent newsletter, which further developed the theme of ESG integration into private debt, which we discussed during the Green and Sustainable Talks webinar held last September. Can we, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin with this first slide by briefly recalling the key takeaways from last September's session, which highlighted the rapid growth of private debt funds and the rise of alternative asset class strategies in general. This trend continues to be supported by the current macroeconomic context and the wider trends of environmental and social transition and digitalization among others. Rekin's forecasts of projected volumes of private debt assets under management have been revised upwards since last fall, with AUM now expected to reach over $2.2 trillion by 2027. Next slide, please. Thanks. In tandem, ESG integration has continued to progress with increased efforts by investors and investment managers to assess borrowers' ESG credentials. Last September, we observed that these efforts were accompanied by certain challenges, preventing even further ESG integration, all of which are still true today, but none appears more acute than the issue of ESG data, ESG-related data, how this data is obtained and how it's applied was the subject of meetings we conducted with private debt and other institutional investors and managers at the end of last year. Next slide, please. In addition to regulatory reporting, investors with whom we spoke most often mentioned using ESG data and ESG integration strategies in general to address their own in-house transition goals in addition to fulfilling final investor demand. In terms of accessing ESG data, we noted widespread use by investors of third-party data providers, both for obtaining raw ESG indicators and broader analyses, um, all of which was generally viewed by investors as insufficient to address their needs. Hence the efforts to establish more robust ESG data templates and the title of our article towards data template convergence. Um, next slide. On the next slide, we sum up the three initiatives, uh, the three key initiatives mentioned in our article illustrating these efforts towards data template uh, harmonization. Uh, first of all, ELFA, European Leveraged Finance Association. Most of the viewers today will be familiar with the Alpha fax sheets, which were first published in January 2021 uh, and actually represent a series of templates that have evolved over time, covering 14 specific sectors in addition to a general template. The ELFA has worked closely with the Loan Market Association in establishing this guidance and they have noted in tandem the obligations on financial intermediaries created by the EU's Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, or SFDR, which we will come back to in a couple of minutes, as well as the requirements of the Task Force for uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosure and the UN's Principles for Responsible Investment. The second initiative, more recent one, is the integrated disclosure template created under the ESG Integrated Disclosure Project, or IDP. 
um, which has an impressive list of sponsors, including the Loan Sales and Trading Association in the United States, the Alternative Credit Council, as well as the UNPRI and prominent asset managers. Um, the IDP template incorporates uh, the sustainability industry classification system of the Sustainability Accounting Standard Standards Board, or SASB, as well as the LSTA's, LSTA's ESG due diligence questionnaire and the UNPRI's ESG factor map. As such, the IDP template aims to be universal and to apply to both private credit and broadly syndicated loans. Like the ELFA fact sheets, the IDP template also contains general and industry specific questions and both uh, EF, ELFA and the IDP are trying to gain engagement and support from private equity sponsors in addition to banks, law firms and uh, investors themselves. A slightly different approach is offered by the, the third package, which is included on our slide, which is the ESG Covenant package sponsored by the Global Infrastructure Investment Association, which represents seven major institutional infrastructure investors and specifically targets commitments from borrowers in loan documentation as a way to facilitate data collection. This, this template is closely based on the SFDR while going into a little bit more detail and also addressing the requirements of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. Next slide, please. Thanks. In evaluating these initiatives, it's useful to break down their composition into the three main categories of E, S, and G, which we do on this slide. And you can see on the left the, the breakdown into uh, several subcategories. The questionnaires can also be broken down into specific themes, as I mentioned earlier, general versus specific industry questions, quantitative as opposed to qualitative questions, etc. So viewed in this way um, and presented this way, there's a tendency to see a convergence in the approach of the different questionnaires, even though a single consensus appears some way off. In this regard, it's Interesting to note that all of the main metrics within these subcategories are covered by the SFTR principal adverse indicators, which are the baseline in terms of regulatory reporting and appear to be the lowest common denominator in terms of overall approach, even though the information sought by investors for their own purposes tends to be broader and more qualitative. In that light, I'm pleased to give the floor to uh, Thomas Girard, head of the Green and Sustainable Syndicate, to speak about SFDR in a little bit more detail, as well as Natixis's approach to its parameters. Thomas? Yes, thank you very much, William. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, so yes, uh, considering the, the diversity of the other audience, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody knows what we are talking about, because actually what is clearly at stake uh, beyond uh, EIG data availability is uh, transparency and reporting, especially from investors. Uh, and uh, what is impacting uh, from a regulation standpoint today, uh, investors is uh, so-called SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Uh, it applies to all financial market participants and financial advisors. And, uh, and it's about integrating and managing uh, sustainability factors uh, within uh, investment uh, decision uh, and it came uh, even if it came into effect uh, in March 2021 uh, we have uh, since January this year uh, I will say uh, another layer of this regulation uh, uh, which uh, came into uh, into force and uh, and now investors have to report especially on uh, principal adverse impact uh, notably for their article 8 and article 9 fund under SFDR classification, investors uh, in Europe have to classify their fund under the, the three um, type of uh, families, Article 6, 8 and 9, as you can see on the, on the screen. Bear in mind that Article 8 and 9 are um, funds uh, promoting uh, ESG uh, characteristics and even uh, in search of uh, impact. 
I would say that SFDR is uh, meant to be the new uh, the new the new norm uh, because uh, uh, at the end of uh, uh, 2022, uh, it's now clear that uh, uh, half of the market uh, has been classified under Article Eight or Nine. So uh, it, it's not uh, a, a niche. Uh, I would say. Uh, uh, need uh, anymore ESG data, but ESG data are definitely needed uh, for uh, for mainstream uh, investors uh, for the for the mainstream. If we go on the on the next slide, so when you next slide, please. Thank you. So when you uh, do uh, invest uh, with a fund uh, classified under Article Eight or Nine. Uh, you need to uh, invest uh, in uh, sustainable in investment, what is considered a sustainable investment. And in that respect, uh, there's a, a flexibility in a way because uh, each and every investor have uh, a different uh, definition of, of what is a sustainable investment. Uh, but as guidelines uh, provided by SFDR, uh, funds need to uh, contribute to uh, uh, an environmental or social uh, objective, i.e. Uh, invest in, um, in projects or in companies that are aligned with the EU taxonomy, uh, contributing to a, a sustainable development goal or, uh, or investing in, uh, I would say, uh, labeled uh, green uh, or EAG uh, instrument, like uh, in a use of proceed uh, uh, bond, uh, be it green, social or sustainable. Uh, but you do also do have to to, um, to do um, a, a do not significant harm assessment first on the uh, four other uh, taxonomies. Uh, so beyond climate change mitigation and adaptation, you also have to uh, to look at potential uh, and significant controversies. Uh, do uh, the uh, assessment of ESG practices and look again at principal adverse impact. When it comes to the principal adverse impact, um, it's Next slide, please. It's uh, especially uh, quite tricky to do the assessment on the, um, not very well covered uh, areas of investment, and especially uh, on the corporate side uh, for smith cap companies uh, that uh, uh, not necessarily have to report on ESG uh, to date. Uh, some of them will have to report uh, in the future, notably uh, uh, because of the uh, CSRD, uh, the new regulation uh, impacting uh, companies and making mandatory uh, ESG disclosure. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when it comes to um, uh, projects, uh, real assets, uh, there is no such uh, regulation impacting uh, project uh, companies, uh, special purpose uh, vehicle. And this is where we do think uh, we can help our investor client uh, to invest in real assets, especially uh, in infra and in real estate, uh, and, and at the same time uh, to, uh, to, to, to be compliant with the uh, SFDR and the principal inverse adverse impact, because uh, uh, thanks to the application of the green weighting factor, which is, as you uh, probably know, um, Natixis uh, on the transition tool, we have developed Thank you. Uh, two different approaches, one for dedicated purpose financing and another one for general purpose financing. When it comes to dedicated purpose financing, uh, we have um, decision trees that we are applying to eight macro sector and different subsectors. Uh, as of today, we have uh, uh, 49 uh, different decision trees and by year hand, we will have uh, 80, uh, 80 of them. Thanks to uh, these decision trees, uh, we end up with a, a color and a score, uh, which is translated in a color, and, and it helps us, Natexis, CIB, to uh, uh, to steer um, uh, the temperature of our portfolio uh, with the aim to become uh, carbon neutral by uh, 20, uh, 2050. Uh, but by applying these uh, uh, decision trees, uh, we are uh, creating and collecting uh, EAG data on the dedicated uh, financing we are granting to, uh, uh, to our clients. And, um, and we are now considering using these, uh, these data uh, to um, uh, serve uh, investors uh, and, and to help them again complying with the EU SFDR uh, regulation. 
The application of the decision trees, I will not go too, uh, too deep in the green rating factor methodology, uh, but uh, it's done in uh, three steps. Uh, first, we determine uh, the average climate score uh, of each sector. So we have a range uh, within um, the financing uh, will be uh, will be uh, assessed and, and the, the, the coloration uh, we will give uh, will uh, differ from a sector to another. Uh, so, for instance, uh, an, an oil uh, power plant will uh, never have uh, a green color under the green uh, green weighting factor. Conversely, a solar power plant uh, uh, can only be uh, uh, colored uh, neutral to, uh, to to dark green because uh, its contribution to uh, to um, to climate uh, climate action. Step two, um, so each sector uh, have a, a, a possible range of rating, uh, as I mentioned. And step three, we apply uh, decision trees. If we go on the next uh, slide. So here is um, a decision tree. Um, sorry for this uh, busy slide, uh, but it's just to, uh, um, to, uh, to show you that uh, uh, while applying uh, the the, the decision tree uh, methodology, uh, we are first able to identify which uh, asset or which product project uh, are eligible to the EU taxonomy. Uh, secondly, uh, we uh, do uh, the technical criteria assessment. So we look at not only contribution, but also we do the do not significant, significant harm uh, assessment. And by doing so, we are also able to uh, extract uh, some ESG data uh, that can be uh, that can be useful uh, with regard to uh, a principal adverse impact uh, reporting. So uh, for telecom sector uh, and uh, the decision tree uh, for data center, as you see uh, uh, on screen, uh, we will be able uh, by your hand uh, to provide uh, information that are PIE. Uh, related, so it will be uh, the carbon intensity uh, of the project. It will be also the share of non-renewable uh, energy uh, as a percentage. It will be uh, the energy con consumption intensity. Uh, we will have also data to report on uh, potential uh, biodiversity uh, impact. Uh, we will be also able to provide uh, data on the breakdown of uh, energy uh, sources. Uh, if there's uh, any uh, means um, or um, tool to uh, uh, to work on the work on water uh, usage uh, and recycling, uh, and also uh, linked to uh, biodiversity, is the project uh, has been uh, set up in a natural uh, species or a protected uh, area. So this is how we uh, attend uh, to uh, accompany our investor clients when it comes to their reporting uh, under uh, SFDR and especially on the uh, real uh, asset uh, financing. It's definitely, as uh, William mentioned, uh, echoing uh, investors' initiative uh, we are seeing currently uh, in the market. And, uh, and we try in that respect um, yeah, to, uh, to be uh, as helpful as we can uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, to tackle and to uh, to report on this uh, on this regulation. That's it on my hand. Happy to uh, uh, to respond to any uh, any question. So we do have a few questions. Um, can count six for now. Do you want to start with your question, uh, Gracian, or? Uh... Probably. Uh, I can see one on the ECB. I don't see any on biodiversity. All right. So um, who is developing the climate scores for the ECB? Well, the the, the ECB has a has a dedicated team uh, on climate. It is built on uh, external data, though. Uh, we know that. Uh, uh, one of um, the data providers is Carbon4 uh, Finance, which is also one of our data providers uh, that we use for the green rating factor, actually. Um, then, which indicator is expected to become dominant for financial in institutions in their external reporting uh, in CSRD? Do you have uh, any points on that, Thomas? Um, 
Sorry, which one? Uh, CSRD. Uh, uh, yeah. No, CSRD is, is only about to apply to, uh, to, 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 to companies, so no, uh, uh, not to uh, SPVs, project companies. Um, CSRD is actually uh, widening the scope of uh, former uh, uh, NFRD, Non-Financial uh, Reporting Directive, uh, which was uh, applicable uh, only to, uh, I will say, uh, 10,000 uh, large companies uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, CSRD uh, will uh, apply to uh, roughly uh, uh, 60,000 uh, uh, companies, but not to uh, project companies, and not uh, on uh, real uh, real assets. I see another question on ECB records for collateral. Uh, it was mentioned not as uh, to be expected for 2022. If we go back to the slide, the dedicated one, um, it it's being mentioned uh, as going live maybe in 2024 uh, here before end of 2024 limit of share of assets. Um, I know here you're right. Um, consideration it's only a consideration. Uh, it's not uh, it's not live yet. Um, why is this wave of Article 9 declassification, declassification mm. uh, recently? Maybe Thomas? Yes, it's true. We have uh, observed uh, end of last year um, a wave, uh, as mentioned, of uh, Article 9 declassification. Uh, there is a uh, uh, various explanations, I would say. Uh, Article 9 is meant to be uh, uh, the most stringent uh, uh, classification uh, according to the uh, European uh, supervisory uh, authorities. Uh, when you uh, want to, um, to classify your fund uh, under Article 9, you need to, uh, uh, to invest 100% in uh, uh, sustainable investment as per your, uh, uh, your own definition uh, as an investor, but uh, uh, in accordance with the SFDR uh, guidelines uh, that I presented uh, on, a, on a specific slide. So you need to contribute to uh, uh, one of the um, uh, several environmental and social objectives or to uh, one of the taxonomy uh, to, for the time being on uh, climate change adaptation or mitigation. Uh, and uh, you also need to, um, to look at uh, technical uh, criteria and, uh, and, and do, uh, uh, in that respect, uh, do not significant harm uh, assessment. Um, so not going into too much detail, but I think it's quite uh, straightforward and e easy to understand. Uh, it, it does reduce a lot uh, your uh, investment universe. And, uh, and of course, uh, if you're not um, aligned with the uh, SFDR uh, guidelines and, uh, and the recall from the uh, European Supervisory Authority, uh, you are exposed to a potential uh, risk of greenwashing and, uh, and repetition. So in order to avoid uh, these risks, uh, some uh, uh, fund manager has decided to, uh, uh, to reclassify uh, their fund. Um, when you do uh, also manage uh, uh, an Article 9 fund, uh, you need to, uh, to be transparent on the, uh, the way uh, you, uh, uh, you deploy or you have a, a, a good uh, governance practices. Uh, and so you, you, you need also to report on the uh, governance, I would say, uh, uh, assessment. So it, it, it's, uh, uh, I would say, burdensome and, and, and it's explaining uh, uh, the wave of declassification. And last but not least, uh, the um, uh, sustainable investment uh, definition uh, need uh, to be applied uh, across your various uh, uh, investment strategies, uh, uh, within a single uh, asset uh, asset manager, so it, it's another uh, explanation which uh, uh, has led to uh, uh, to, uh, to fund classification. And if I'm correct, uh, a lot of uh, declassification uh, came also from uh, uh, passive strategies uh, ETF. Um, so yes, there's a. Lots of the explanations. So I would say, bear in mind that uh, the new norm is uh, Article 8, and then uh, there will be uh, also uh, Article 9 uh, funds. Uh, but the approach needs to be taken cautiously to avoid potential uh, greenwashing risks. Thanks, Thomas. Um, there's a question on um, how we integrate our data in our financial analysis and rating methodology. I guess it's referring to the green weighting factor. I can answer that. 
so the, the green weighting factor provides a score between uh, between one and seven, um, and that scores impacts the analytical analytical uh, risk weighted assets. So indirectly impacting the analytical uh, profit return profile uh, of an investment. So it's it's um, it's reorienting actually uh, financial flows towards uh, and analytically again towards um, mo mo most virtuous uh, project. So that's how it works. There's a, a another question on biodiversity. Uh, do you believe that biodiversity related finance will dominate climate related finance? Well, for the for the reasons we've uh, we've evoked earlier, the complexity of biodiversity. Uh, for now, it, uh, it we, we do not foresee it uh, as a as a replacing climate finance, and the, the two are complementary actually. Um, but still. Um, since biodiversity encompasses climate change, uh, we can see synthetic indicators encompassing both biodiversity and climate change um, being used in sustainability linked financial products, for example. Uh, that's something that we can see uh, happening in, uh, in the near to uh, uh, long term future. How do you source your biodiversity data? Uh, well, on uh, the, the, the little study we made for um, for the use of KPIs that are related to uh, pressures on biodiversity, we used um, for the sustainability linked bonds. We used uh, the LJX data hub, so uh, so Luxembourg Exchange uh, data hub, and for the loans, we used our own uh, our own data to analyze the KPIs. Um, but there are plenty uh, of uh, databases uh, online which are open source that can be really useful uh, for not maybe to assess companies, but at least to assess um, to assess uh, sectors, uh, risks and dependencies, um, and also to assess given uh, infrastructure in a given geography, for example, exposed to uh, uh, biodiversity related uh, risks or, uh, or dependencies. Um, so I see it's uh, 3 p.m. Uh, thank you very much. I, f I guess we'll stop here. I can I will check other questions if you have any. So now we can. Uh, all right, we'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, you were uh, quite numerous, so thank you. Um, and uh, I hope to see you next time on our next edition of the Green and Sustainable Talks. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Everyone, bye bye.